It was another chaotic and scary day in midtown Manhattan. Police locked down and swarmed Times Square to investigate a suspicious package. It all happened just one block from the spot where a bomb-filled SUV was found just days ago. Here's how the drama unfolded. We're hearing a suspicious package. Parts of Times Square evacuated. This is all about a cooler that has been left in front of the Marriott Marquis Hotel that's on Broadway between 45th and 46th Street, right smack in the middle of Times Square. I'm right in the middle of Broadway. This is 47th Street right behind me. You can still see that there are cars uh, going behind me, but beyond that, you can see that Times Square is entirely empty. I've confirmed with uh, the New York Police Department that the bomb squad has deployed its robot that is doing an X ray of that cooler. And all clear is about to happen. Now we know what was inside the cooler, and the answer is water bottles. New York City has been on high alert since the botched terror attack Saturday. Investigators are looking into a possible conspiracy. The hunt is on for a money man believed to have funneled overseas cash to Faisal Shahzad, the Times Square suspect. Officials are in Pakistan to question members of an al-Qaeda-linked group. Shahzad claims he spent five months at a terrorist training camp there, but the foreign connection is still a big question mark. And just today, General David Petraeus said he believes Faisal Shahzad was a, quote, lone wolf. The scare in Times Square today and the foiled terror attack last weekend has the country doing some serious soul-searching. Americans are facing a new round of debate. How much are people willing to give up in the name of security? Some lawmakers in Congress have rolled out a highly controversial bill to strip the citizenship of Americans suspected of having terror ties. Joining us are Joan Walsh, the editor of Salon.com, and Richard Pearl, former Assistant Secretary of Defense and resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Thank you both for being here. Richard, let me ask you first, uh, if such a law were to go into effect, if someone uh, gave money uh, to one of these many institutions that are out there, let's say Hamas or Hezbollah, uh, would you be okay with that person making a contribution to either of those groups being stripped of their citizenship? Well, of course, it would depend on the circumstances and whether this was done with the knowledge that uh, the contribution was intended to support terrorist activity. Um, I believe the statute as it's drafted uh, uh, deals only with deliberate acts associated with terror and not with accidental or inadvertent ones or uh, acts uh, made in, uh, in ignorance. So there's a, a, a pretty serious burden to demonstrate that uh, the action is justified. But Joan, uh, there are a lot of people who have some serious problems with this, uh, wondering whether it's constitutional or not. Uh, when you take a look at this, does the language seem a little fuzzy to you? I don't know how they prove, uh, Candy, that this person is indeed engaged in terrorism or has joined a terrorist group. Look, I think this bill is clearly unconstitutional the way it's written. I think the case law and the precedents are very strong. In 1967, the Supreme Court ruled on behalf of a Jewish man who actually took a trip to Israel and while he was there, he, he voted in the Knesset and the United States tried to strip him of his citizenship. They ruled very strongly that this right is almost, almost impossible to take away from us. But let me say one more thing that's more relevant. This is a dumb law, because let's say this law passed and it was in effect now. Eric Holder, instead of getting every shred of information preventing another attack, Eric Holder and his lawyers would be in a courtroom trying to prove that in, in some fashion, because you'd have to have some kind of evidentiary rules, basis for making this, this determination, that's what we'd be doing, that's what our lawyers would be doing, was, would be proving that he should have his citizenship taken away. How would that make us safer? Richard, what is the point, do you think, here? Like, from an investigative or a counterterrorism perspective, what do you get if you strip somebody of their citizenship before a trial? Well, uh, presumably the only illegal act committed by an individual subjected to this uh, would be uh, joining a terrorist organization or uh, uh, engaging in activity which, if it came to fruition, would result in an act of terror. The issue partly is whether we're going to wait until the attack takes place uh, or whether we're going to uh, attempt to act before. And uh, given the dangers that we face, given the possibility that uh, 
a future act of terror will involve a weapon of mass destruction. It seems to me if we get on to someone but who is working with terrorists, we ought to take some action first. Well, we do. We do take some action. We come after them. There are laws, existing laws on the book, books. They don't uh, take away someone's citizenship, but they do make it possible to try them, to convict them, and to sentence them to very long, long prison sentences, even for collaborating, planning, giving money, joining, joining a group. Those things, many of those things are already crimes, so I don't see... A, what this gets us in terms of safety, and B, what, this, what would the standard of proof be? It couldn't simply be that I say, Richard Pearl is a terrorist, he joined a terrorist group. So what, what would the standard of proof be that, well, that, would, be, would, that would be sufficient to take away my citizenship or yours? Well, ultimately, that uh, uh, would presumably be up to the courts because an individual so affected would have a right to appeal uh, to the federal courts, and I have right. some confidence that it would be properly uh, adjudicated. But the statute that's being amended here to include uh, acts of terror is a statute that exists today, and it takes citizenship away from people who, for example, join an army in combat with the United States. I, I haven't heard anyone object to that. But the nature of warfare has changed. We're a lot less concerned now about people who join an army battling the army of the United States than we are about people who join, say, an al-Qaeda and prepare or commit acts of terror. And that's what this is intended to deal with. Richard, I've got to stop it here. Um, I'm sorry. I know on 24-hour TV you ought to be able to go longer, but we, we've got to run. <laughs> Richard Pearl, Joan Walsh, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks, Kim. Coming up, the time...